Psalm 37. And I'm going to invite you this morning to um, keep your Bibles open because we're going to be jumping all over this chapter um, and looking at various different passages in this text. Um, I'm not going to read it. There's about 40 different 40 verses in here, but we're going to look at a lot of these verses this morning. But Psalm 37 is where we're going to be today. We are in the middle of a summer series called The Summer in the Psalms. I mean, how original is that? Um, and we are looking at some of our favorite psalms. We're just more of a devotional, just reflecting on what the psalmist says and how it speaks to our hearts. These psalms are powerful because these are the expressions of different individuals who poured out their hearts to God. Sometimes they're pouring it out in frustration and anger that God is not moving and working in their lives. And then there's other psalms that are psalms of worship and adoration and praise. And so we've had four or five different speakers speaking over the last couple of weeks, and we're going to have different speakers coming in and talking on their favorite psalms. And I've noticed a lot of the psalms that we've been addressing are psalms of, that deal with our emotions, talking about our frustrations and our um, wondering how God is moving. And we're going to continue in that as we look at Psalm 37 this morning. When Ng was singing, he talked about how we live in a world in a time where there's a lot that makes us question where God is and what God is up to. We live in a world where bad things continue to happen. Globally, we see brothers and sisters of ours who die for their faith simply because they are followers of Jesus, not because they did anything wrong, but because they choose to follow Jesus. They are beheaded. They are murdered for being followers of Jesus. And we wonder, God, why is horrible things happening to good people. And when we look at on the flip side and we see people that have no regard for God, we have, they have no respect for God and outright, outright disregard for the things of God, and we see them prosper and succeed in life, and we wonder, God, why are they succeeding? And yet these guys who have chosen to follow you, pursue you, their life is miserable. They're going through difficulties. It's a question we often ask. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? And maybe on a more personal level, your head, your mind might be filled with painful thoughts of how maybe you suffered unjustly while others have succeeded in their scheming and corner cutting and their manipulation and in dishonesty and violence and greed. Sometimes life doesn't seem fair. It's part of the human experience to see wicked people prosper and get ahead while good people often get trampled under. And more specifically, what we've seen throughout the history of the church is that those who follow Christ know and are expected to experience hatred, rejection, mistreatment from those who don't share their faith in Jesus. And you know, for people of God, that can cause a great crisis in our faith. It's difficult to understand how we can pursue God and pursue Jesus, and yet horrible things will happen in our lives. John Calvin, the reformer, said it this way, Since the faithful, so long as they pursue their earthly pilgrimage through life, see things strangely confused in this world, unless they usage their grief with the hope for a better situation, their courage will soon fail. You know, life oftentimes seems confusing, and that makes us confused. Every human being, even the most avid atheist, has a sense that good will win and they should be rewarded, whereas evil will lose and they should be punished. That's why we love our fairy tales. That's why we love our superheroes. The psalmist David wrote Psalm 37 years down in his life. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he reflects of a lifetime of injustices that he's endured in his own life and injustices that he's seen in the lives of people around him. And he gives priceless wisdom in this psalm in the form of an acoustic psalm. See, many psalms that we've looked at are man's responses to God, man's frustrations of why God's not moving. But Psalm 37 is different because it is God's revelation to man. David's intent is to strengthen 
the righteous people by giving them clarity and hope for the times when life seems unfair. And it helps us learn how to live life when good people experience horrible situations and vice versa. Here's what we learn in the psalm. Here's the main point. When life seems unfair, trust in God to even the odds. When life seems unfair, trust in God to even the odds. Trust. We sang about it this morning. Trust and obey for there's no other way. Trust. See, this is what God calls us to do when life gets turned upside down. And trust is not a vague hope that somehow everything will work out, but trust is a hope that there's a God who is working behind the scenes. There's a God who balances the scales of justice. Verse 28 of Psalm 37 says, God loves justice. He will not forsake His people. He will not forsake His saints. It is with the character and purposes of God that the psalmist encourages us and he challenges us. See, if it weren't for God, if it weren't for His will, if it weren't for His character, we would have no reason to hope at all. And the psalmist in this text gives us five truths that reminds us of how to trust God when life gets difficult. How we trust God when life gets hard for us. And before we look at the five statements, let me say a quick word about good people and bad people because I think that's necessary. The Bible makes it clear that when it comes down to it, measured against the holiness of God and the perfection of His law, there really are no good people. None of us in this room are good. None of us deserve the blessings of God. It is the grace and the mercy of God that we have experienced His love and compassion for us. Jesus was the only true and fully righteous man to ever live. The righteous that the psalmist talks about are not good people who have won God's acceptance because they lived good lives. Instead, these are people that God has brought into a relationship with Him. Their righteousness is a status that has been given to them by God as a gift not something that they've earned, not a quality that they possess. The righteous are people who believe in God and walk with God, and through faith, God has made them right with God. They are in a covenant relationship with God, and because they're in that covenant relationship, they have the promises of God's salvation, they have the promises of God's deliverance, they have the promises of God's love, and ultimately they have the promises of God's justice in their lives. So let's be careful about dividing the world into an us-versus-them battle between the righteous and the unrighteous. Because if it wasn't for the grace of God, there would be no difference. But let's also make a point that there are people in this world whose lives are so characterized by evil, characterized by a complete disregard for God's will, there's an outright antagonism against His purposes that most people regardless of religious affiliation, would say they are evildoers. And when they get their way, life seems unfair. When people who outright reject God seems to live in luxury and happiness, life seems unfair. But let's be clear that we're not good because of what we do. We're good because of God's grace and mercy in our lives. So having cleared that up, let's turn to these five principles that David gives us to help us learn to trust God when life seems unfair. Number one, first thing he tells us is to take another look at life from God's perspective. Take another look at life from God's perspective. Perspective is so important. Without it, we lose our bearings and fail to see life as it really is. Without perspective, we tend to miscalculate The perspective that we all need, especially when life is difficult and life is throwing us into a whirlwind, is a perspective of God. His perspective is perfect. And the psalmist shows us three different ways how God's perspective is different from our perspective. Number one, he says, the problem is laid out for us in verse one. He says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. Verse 7 says, Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, or the man who carries out evil devices. 
when evil people succeed in their plans and appear to get away with it, we all need to know how to view the situation. We need some angle from which to understand things which will help us to trust God rather than to lose our faith in God. And the Psalms, psalmist helps us in three different ways. Number one, he reminds us that God sees everything. We serve a God who sees everything. Verse 12 says, The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at him, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees his day coming. Verse 18 says, The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and his heritage will remain forever. See, even though it may seem that God is not doing anything, he is fully aware of what's going on. He only, not only knows what the wicked are up to, but he also knows what the righteous are going through. His eyes are on both. His eyes are everywhere. He sees everything. And the second thing the psalmist says is that he reminds us that the reign of the wicked is fragile. It's brief. It's not going to be here long. Verse 2 says, They will fade away like grass and wither like the green herb. Evildoers are no more lasting and secure than the grasses that are here today and gone tomorrow. The wicked, God reminds us, are as fragile as the des- grass in the desert. See, furthermore, it won't be long before God breeds on them and they're gone. Verse 10 says, In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you carefully look at his place, he will not be there. That's crucial for us to know. When we suffer unjustly at the hands of evildoers, time drags on like a snail's pace. Minutes seems like hours. Hours seems like days. Days feels like years. Years feels like lifetime. But God reminds us in the text that it won't be long. They are not nearly as powerful or enduring as they or we think they are. And the third piece of perspective that God gives us here is that the wicked will not get away with it. The problem of suffering and successes of evil have always been a major obstacle for people of faith, both intellectually and spiritually. Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York recently did an email survey of thousands of students, people in, mid-20, people in their mid-20s, who were asked to voice their main objections about Christianity. Here's what one young lady by the name of Hillary said. She said, I don't believe the God of Christianity exists. God allows terrible suffering in the world. So he might be either all powerful but not good enough to end evil and suffering, or he might be all good but not all powerful to end suffering and evil. Either way, the all good, all powerful God of the Bible does not exist. Hillary's lost perspective. And without Psalm 37, so would we. See, but unlike the agnostic who says, who knows if there's a God that can make things right? Or the atheist that says, well, there is no God, so this is the way it's going to be. David makes it clear that there is a God, and he will balance the scales of life. Verse 9 says, the evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the land. So when life seems unfair. The first step in trusting God is to take another look at life from God's perspective. So if you do that, the next step becomes much easier. Step number two is to resist the temptation to take matters into your own hands. Resist the temptation to take matters into your own hands. Seeing wicked people prosper, can I be honest, is a major source of temptation for followers of Jesus. We get tempted many ways when we see wicked people prosper. One, the first temptation is we get angry. We get angry when we see bad people succeeding in life. And the psalmist warns us about the danger of getting angry. Verse 1, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Verse 8, refrain from anger, forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it only tends to evil. In the original, the word fret literally means to become hot. In other words, when you see wicked people succeeding, don't get all worked up. Don't get all riled up. Don't get angry. Keep your cool. Why? Verse 8 says, because it only tends to evil. See, none of us will do good when we're angry. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says it this way, the anger of a man cannot accomplish 
the righteousness that God requires for us. See, when we get angry, we want to get even, and we're tempted to take matters into our own hands. And if you've ever done that, you know that that only makes the situation much worse. And besides, who are we to, who are we really fit to judge? See, we need to resist the temptation to act in anger, and we need to listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans when he says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, because it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So we're tempted to get angry. I don't know about you, sometimes we're tempted to be envious. They have good things going on in life. Everything's going well. God, I want what they have. I want the security that they have. I want the funds that they have. I want the lifestyle that they have. We tend to get envious. We envy their success. We envy their power. The thinking is if we can't beat them, we might as well join them. And then another temptation comes in. And this is the temptation to compromise. You adopt some of their methods so that you can share in their apparent successes. And George looked at Psalm 73 a few weeks ago. And verse 12 and 13 of Psalm 73 says this, Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They're increasing in riches. And yet in vain I kept my heart clean. And in vain I washed my hands in innocence. But the psalmist in Psalm 73, by the end of it, comes to his senses and realizes that he's thinking as a fool. See, there's three ways that we can handle the injustices of life. We can beat them, we can join them, or we can trust him. Those are the only three responses that we have. Two of them will not cut it. One will. Trust God. Resist the temptation to take matters into your own hands. Number one. Take a look at life from another perspective. Number two, resist the temptation to take matters into your own hands. And number three, unload your burden onto God. Verse 5, verse 7, love these passages. It says, commit your way to God. Trust in Him, and He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as a light and your justice as a noonday. Be still before God. Wait patiently. The word commit there, in the, word, in the original Hebrew, literally is the word roll. Therefore, a better translation of this verse would say, roll your burden, roll your ways onto God. The imagery here is someone who's trying to carry a weight that is too big for him. And he can't carry it all by himself, so they roll it onto someone else's shoulders who is stronger than they are. See, when you see people get away with their plans, or when you have people in your life that mistreat you unjustly, roll your burdens onto God. Unload them onto someone that's stronger than you. Pray, commit your life to Him until you no longer tremble with fear or fidget with nervousness or pace with uneasiness. Trust that He can handle the burdens of your life. And he says that we are to simply be still before God, wait for him to act. The Apostle Peter would write it this way, cast all of your worries, cast all of your cares, cast all of your concerns on him. Why? Because he cares for you. I love that verse because it doesn't just say, cast your big burdens that you can't handle yourself onto him. Just cast all of your worries. You're worried about what tomorrow's going to look like? Commit it to God. You're worried about the future of your children? Commit it to God. You're worried about the amount of money in your bank account? Give it to God. You're worried about that you're sneezing and you don't know what's going on? Give it to God. You're worried about what food you're about to eat? Give it to God. Cast every worry Big worry, small worry, medium worry, life-changing worry. Give it to God. Why? You serve a God who cares for you. You serve a God who is intimately involved in your life. He is concerned about the things that concern you. He cares about the things that bother you. Big, small, it doesn't matter. He says he cares for you. 
So carry your burden. Let it go into the hands of God. Martin Luther summed up this psalm as a call to suffer. That is, a call to learn patience, to cast your cares upon God, to do not murmur, to not be angry, to wish no ill on the wicked, to leave the management and the government of everything to God. Because why? He's a righteous judge. When are we going to learn to leave the management of, and government of everything in our lives to God? Only when we learn to trust Him by unloading our burdens onto God. See, like Atlas, we try to hold up the weight of the world by our own strength, like Superman or Batman or Iron Man, or you can pick your favorite superhero. We try to fly here and go there and rescue the world from evil, but only one person is able to wear, bear the weight of the world without being crushed and exhausted, and that person is Jesus. The prophet Isaiah would write this way, prophesying about the birth of Jesus. He says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a child, son is given, given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He can handle it. He can handle your burdens. And while he's handling your burdens, he can handle the burdens of the entire world. He's able You don't have to carry it by yourself. You don't have to fret. You don't have to worry. Let Jesus carry your burdens for you. You need to take a look at another perspective of life from a different perspective. You need to resist the temptation to act. You need to unload your burdens to God. Number four, you need to seek your satisfaction in God. Verse three says, trust in God and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. See, rather than angering yourself by focusing on evildoers and everything bad that's happening in the world, the psalmist says, focus on God. Be satisfied in God. Delight yourself in God. And when you do that, you'll find joy and contentment in a chaotic world. Delighting yourself in God means that you need to delight yourself in God's will for your life. Elizabeth Elliot is a woman of faith that recently just went to be with Jesus. But she once wrote that to love God is to love His will. She was a woman that knew how to suffer unjustly. As young college graduates, her and her husband, along with several others, went to South America to be missionaries and share the gospel with the Akua Indians. And when they got there, her husband and five others were murdered as soon as they got there. And yet she writes, to love God is to love the will of God. See, it's impossible for us to delight ourselves in God when we're disgusted with His will. But to delight in God's will means that we can find joy and satisfaction in doing what is right and good, even when it means that we might not materially be rewarded at the present time. To love God and pursue God took Jesus to the cross. To love God and pursue God took Paul to martyrdom. To love God and pursue God took Peter to be died upside down. To love God and pursue God meant our Syrian brothers and sisters have lost their faith, uh, lost their lives because they were followers of Jesus, but they loved God more than they loved life. And for them, we thank God for their lives. Sometimes loving and pursuing God doesn't mean that your life will be perfect and every, it'll be great. It means that no matter what you go through, you have a God who is with you right through it. You need to be able to trust Him there. But listen, it also means to be blooming where you're planted. Oftentimes, we want something better and we're waiting for God to move and work that we don't thrive and grow where we're at. Can I suggest to you that God has put you exactly where He wants you? And He wants you to bloom and prosper there no matter what is going on around you. Verse 3 says, Dwell in the land and stay enjoy safe pasture. Some of us are so busy complaining about what's going on that all we are is negative talkers that we never are a blessing to the people around us. 
that we never encourage people around us because we're so focused on the negative. Delight yourself in God. See how good He is. See how marvelous He is. And then live your life in such a way where people that are living in this messed up world will see your life and they'll say, why are you different? That can only happen when you delight yourself in God. Secondly, to find satisfaction in God, you must delight yourself in God's being and God's character. By faith and through prayer, we can behold Him in all of His glory. When you meditate on who He is, when you meditate on His grace in your life, when you meditate on His holiness, when you meditate on His love for you, when you meditate on His power, when you meditate on His faithfulness, when you meditate on His justice, when you know Him, you are delighted by Him. He gives to us a peace and joy that can be there despite our circumstances. He becomes the one thing that we desire over everything else in life. The Apostle Peter explained it this way, that this is what it's like to delight yourself in God. He said, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. See, I think the reason that so few of us truly delight ourselves in God is because we don't know him well enough. We don't know him well enough. And the reason we don't know him well enough is because we spend so little time being with him in reading his words and what he is saying to us in talking to him in prayer see if we have a greater knowledge of god you will be delighted with him so you cannot know god and not love him when you read scriptures and see how good and great he is in your life you can't help but love him jonathan edwards in his treatise the religious affection says where there is a light of the knowledge of god in your head there becomes a warm glow of love and joy in your heart. When life seems unfair, let me encourage you, seek your satisfaction in a good God, in a Savior named Jesus who gave his life for you, in the Holy Spirit who now lives with you and is leading you and guiding you every step of the way. Few people in the history of the church have exemplified this more better than a missionary by the name of David Livingston. He was, a, he was the Indiana Jones of the Victorian era of England. His adventurous travels throughout Africa made great stories for the papers back home in England, but they also presented many trials, dangers, and difficulties. And yet through it all, David Livingston was a man with fervent devotion and prayer to God. His favorite psalm was Psalm 37. And at the end of his life when he died, his friends found him dead, kneeling on his face with an open Bible, which is open to the psalm. He was a man that delighted in God. See, the call to delight in God also carries a promise for us. Verse 4 says, Delight yourself in God, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now listen, that, is not, that doesn't mean that God is going to give you whatever superficial, materialistic, or selfish desire you have. That's not what that text means. It means that he is faithful to give you in his time the desire that he has placed in your heart. When you delight yourself in God, you become more like him. Your heart becomes more molded like his heart. And before long, you begin to love the things that God loves. You begin to want the things that God wants. And therefore, he is pleased in due time to give you those desires. He knows what you need. He knows what you are waiting on him for. And he promises here that he will give you those things to you in his perfect time. Take a look at life from a different perspective. Resist the temptation to take matters into your own hands. Unload the burdens onto God. Seek satisfaction in God. And finally... Take hold of God's promises. Take hold of God's promises. And I love this psalm because it's full of promises for us as believers. These promises are meant to encourage us to trust God when life is unfair and when we are provoked by the successes of people around us. The final step in trusting God is to take hold of the promises by faith and wait in full assurance that He will fulfill them. David encourages us with a number of promises in this passage 
about the character and the purposes of God. Listen, if you are a child of God, you have been redeemed by the death and the resurrection of Jesus, these promises are for you. These are your promises. There's an old saying that says, God says it in his word, I believe it in my heart, that settles it in my mind. What are these promises? Number one, he promises he will never abandon you. He will never abandon you. Verse 28, he will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. In the New Testament, this promise is reaffirmed for us by Jesus when he descends into heaven. He says these words. These are his last words. He says, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He sent his spirit to dwell with us until that day when we will dwell with him forever. Listen, child of God, brother, sister, take comfort. The fact that you are being treated unfairly or suffering unjustly is not evidence that God has abandoned you. He is still with you always. He will make himself known very soon to you. God did not say that you will be my people and I will be your God maybe for a little while. Or maybe if things work out. Or maybe if you get your act together. That's not what he says. He says, I will be your God. And you will be my people, period. There are no exceptions. There are no clauses. If you are a child of God, you are his. There is nothing that can pluck you out of his hands. There is nothing that can keep you away. The Apostle Paul says, what can separate me from the love of God? There is nothing. He promises he will never abandon you. Second, he promises he will provide for you. Verse 19, no matter how, things, how tough things get, we have a promise that God will give us what we need. Verse 19 says, they are not put to shame in evil times, but in times of famine they will have abundance. Verse 25 says, I have been young, now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the children begging for bread. Promise number three, he will defend you. Verse 23 says, the steps of the Lord are established by the steps of the man are established by the Lord. When he delights in his way, though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. Listen, he'll be there to hold your hand, to guard your way when things get rough and dangerous in your life. And even though you may trip, and even though you may stumble, and even though you feel like you're falling, it's Jesus that's holding you. You're in his hands. You will not fall. Not only will he uphold you, but he will defend you against those who attack you. Verse 14, verse 15, the wicked draw their sword and bend their bows to bring down the needy and the poor to slay those whose way is upright. But their sword shall enter their own heart. Their bows shall be broken. He will defend you. Number four, he will vindicate you. In time, God will show that you are in the right and the evildoers in the wrong. Verse 6 says, He will bring forth your righteousness as a light and your justice as a noonday. Listen, all who succeed now are not right and all who suffer now are not wrong. God knows the difference and will make it plain in the end. God will, not you. God will. You've got to trust Him. You've got to wait on Him to balance the scales. And finally, He will reward you. See, throughout this psalm, if you read it, there is one line that's repeated over and over. Verse 9, the meek shall inherit the earth. Verse 11, the meek shall inherit the land. Verse 22, the blessed by God shall inherit the land. Verse 34, those who wait on the Lord keep his ways, they shall inherit the land. See, this is the ultimate reward for those who wait on God, for those who trust in God, for those who belong in a covenant relationship with God. See, to the Old Testament saints, this was a promise of a physical land. This was a promise of the land of Israel. This had a concrete meaning. It referred to the promised land, the land that was promised to Abraham and his descendants. But when the promised land is overrun and inhabited by God's enemies, or the Israelites became wicked or unjust, the faithful would long for the day where the land would again be ruled by peace and justice. They had the promise that this would indeed come true, and often it did. 
But listen, you and I, we have an even greater promise. In the New Testament, with the coming of the kingdom of God, Jesus expanded this promise to include the whole earth. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said it this way, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not just the land, the earth. See, this was the promise all along. We learn in Romans 4 that when God promised to Abraham and his descendants was that he would be the heir to the world. Imagine that for a minute. Because you belong to Jesus, you will inherit the earth. Not this earth. Not one that is full of pain and suffering and decay. But a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more sin, where there will be no more injustice, where there will be no more racism, where there will be no more strife or war or anger or murder, but a land where there is righteousness and peace and where there is Jesus. You'll look for evildoers there, but you'll not find them. You'll look for sinners there, but you'll not find them. It will be a place where we will dwell forever in the presence of our great and awesome God, the God who balances the scales ultimately. Let me go through those five things one more time, and I want you to notice what it says here. Take another look at life from God's perspective. Resist the temptation to take matters into your own hands. Unload your burdens onto God. Seek your satisfaction in God. Take hold of the promises of God. Trust. How do you trust? When you follow these five steps. God doesn't promise that life will be easy. God doesn't promise that everything will go the way you want it to go. But he does promise that he will be with you till the end and that he is faithful to complete what he started in your life. Trusting God took our Savior to the cross. He lived the life that you and I should have lived, died the death that you and I should have died. And because he took our place and because he took the burdens of our sins and our injustices and our mess onto his life, this morning, if you are a child of God, you sit in this room not as a sinner, not as an orphan, not as someone outcast and rejected by God, but because of Jesus, you sit here as forgiven, as a son and a daughter of God. This morning, like every week, we have an opportunity to come and celebrate the table. We do, we celebrate this table every week for several reasons, but one of the main reasons is because we need to be reminded week in and week out that it is not our righteousness and our goodness that is enabling us or sustaining us, but it is because Jesus trusted the Father, gave his life on the cross for us, and because of that, we've been forgiven. See, we need to be reminded that life is not about us, that we don't have a way that we can earn God's favor. We need to be reminded that we need to trust and depend on Jesus. So this morning, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, your attitudes, your affections, your desires. Can I be honest? There's, as I was speaking, God was reminding me of people that I have held grudges against, people that I need to basically let go and trust that God would take care of the situation, whatever it may be. So this is not a message just for you. The Holy Spirit was speaking even to me. And there might be people in your life that you're just wishing evil upon them or they've hurt you unjustly and you just can't get them out of your mind. And this morning, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and say, would you just release it? Would you just let me carry that burden for you? Maybe there's people in your life that hurt you. Maybe there's people in your life that did you wrong. And it affects how you live. You've lost your joy. You've lost your peace. You've lost why you live. And this morning, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and saying, let it go. Put your burdens on me. 
Trust me that I am faithful to you till the very end. Trust my promises. Trust that I will not abandon you. Trust that I will defend you. Trust that I will provide for you. Trust that I will make things right in your life. Will you trust me? As you come to the table before you come, would you examine your heart, your attitude, your affections? Would you let the Holy Spirit deal with your life? If there are things that he is bringing you to conviction on, would you repent? And whenever you are ready, I invite you. The way we do communion here at Love City is a worship team will sing. And at that point, whenever you are ready, you're welcome to come and grab the elements. As soon as the team is done, I'll come back up and we'll partake of communion together. So would you spend some time before God as the worship team sings? And then whenever you're ready, you're welcome to come and grab the elements. Let's worship.